Okay, hello. Uh, today we're going to be uh, learning about neural networks. Um, so we're going to. So there are some mistakes in the way that we did it last time. So we're going to revise over the what we covered last time, and then we're also going to go ahead and um, learn some new stuff, and then we're going to actually implement one. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to implement it on uh, character uh, character classifications, uh, on specifically on numbers. So. Basically, if you give it a handwritten digit from 0 to 9, it should be able to identify which digit is it, it's portrayed in the picture. So uh, th that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, so we'll just wait for people to join. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. So uh, on your window, you probably want to go ahead and uh, open up a terminal right now. Uh, and we're going to, this is this is going to take a while. So we'll just go ahead and uh, do this right now. And then I'll get into the presentation once we finish this part up. So uh, right now on your computer, you need to create a new content environment because we need to be able to uh, well, we want to. So the library we're going to be using to create the neural networks is called TensorFlow. Uh, that's usually the most popular one. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to use a conda command. Uh, then you're going to create a new environment. So uh, create conda create, and then the name of the environment can be specified with the n flag. So dash n. You can name it whatever you want. Uh, for example, uh, TensorFlow. Okay, TensorFlow. Um, so that'll be the name of the environment. Uh, and then you can specify the Python version. Uh, I would recommend probably 3.7.5. Uh, I think that's that, that's the last version, or that, that, that version works um, from what I remember. So uh, you can run this command. I already have an environment called TensorFlow. Uh, so what you can do once, you, once that happens, it'll give you a few prompts, just hit yes. Um, then that'll create your new TensorFlow environment. So now you need to get into the TensorFlow environment. So you're going to run uh, conda activate TensorFlow. Uh, this time I am actually going to run it. So now you can see right here, it changed from base to TensorFlow. That means that I have all of my TensorFlow packages in here. Uh, or Well, for you right now, it'll be a blank environment. So we won't have anything inside of there. But uh, you need to go ahead and install all of those packages. So you can run a pip install. And remember, this will be like a blank Python install, maybe like with a few basic packages. 
So you're going to want to install uh, numpy, matplotlib, and tensorflow. Okay, uh, so that'll be all of the, so you, once you run this command, that'll be everything that you need for today's lesson. So uh, that's just what I wanted to briefly go over before we uh, start. So do this right now, so that way once I finish the presentation, uh, you'll have your, uh, once I finish this presentation, then you'll be able to uh, get ready in your environment. So let's go over neural networks and we're gonna briefly go back over how they work because we screwed it up last time. Uh, we made a mistake in how we explained it. So uh, as you can see, this is the basic structure of a neural network. Uh, so let's look at the individual perceptron. So what's gonna happen is for a perceptron, we get our inputs from the previous layers, right? So uh, you can see that we have these uh, X's over here. Um, so you're gonna get those, those are the inputs from the previous layer, right? So in this case, we're gonna assume that there's like uh, three layers, right? So uh, once we get these inputs, they're gonna uh, go in and the weights are basically like the connections between each of the perceptrons, right? So these are all weights coming from the previous layer of, uh, of, of perceptrons. And you can see like, you know, we have weight zero, one, two, and so on, so on, right? Okay, so that's going to come into our actual perceptron. So this is our perceptron, right? Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll sum together each of the weights times the inputs, right? So this is the weight right here. This is the input. Okay, uh, then we're going to add a bias to this. Sorry, I forgot to add this part. Um, but basically plus B right here, right? So uh, you'll hear a lot of the times uh, say people saying weights and biases. That's uh, in the, that's, they're referring to the perceptrons, right? So you're going to have your weights multiplied by your inputs from the previous layers, right? So the weight basically determines how important is this input specifically right here, right? So uh, if it's a weight closer to one, that means it's going to take the whole thing. If it's closer to zero, that means that this input doesn't really matter, right? Because zero times anything is just zero. So that's not going to weigh into our final answer. Then we're gonna add a bias to this, right? So it should be sum of w i x i plus b, right? Uh, so uh, it's gonna add a bias to this. Uh, so that's another trainable feature. So trainable features are basically what's gonna be affected as we train, right? What's gonna op be optimized so that we can get the best uh, and most accurate results, right? So the trainable parameters are gonna be your weights, right? So w zero, one, two, three, so on and your bias, right? So this thing plus B. So remember this whole sigma thing, sigma expression plus B. I forgot to add the plus B, but uh, I'll, I'll add it in later. Uh, but anyway, so once you get that, that's the input for this neural, for this neuron, right? For this perceptron. So then it's gonna take that, again, it's this thing plus B, that's gonna go into this ReLU function. So again, bias, the B plus B, that's another trainable fact. Uh, that's another trainable uh, variable, right? So, uh, or a feature, right? So you, you can train the bias again to make your neural network more accurate, and it's going to do optimize these for every single neuron. That that's how uh, training actually is going to work. We'll see that once we implement this later on uh, in today's lesson. So you can see that this uh, thing again plus b uh, is going to go into our activation function. In this case, I chose the ReLU optimization or activation function uh, just because that's usually the one that you're going to use. That's the most common one for between dense layers. Uh, so it's going to go through this. So what, what this does is, is uh, it's going to return the value normally if it's greater than zero. And if it's less than zero or equal to zero, it's just going to return zero, right? So uh, this is a very versatile function. So basically, if it's negative, it won't count the output at all. If it's positive, it'll just return whatever it is, right? So this goes into the next into the next layer. So I just drew one right here, but this arrow would go to every single neuron in the in the next layer, right? So let's uh, kind of go through this. So we'll have our two inputs, right? So this is our input layer. So we'll have our two inputs, right? Uh, this could be whatever we decide, right? So it could be, say, a person's, um, I don't know, give me some things. Um, maybe they're, uh, uh, their uh, mm, blood glucose and their uh, 
weight or something, right? Uh, so th you could put those into here and then maybe it'll, so then uh, those will be your inputs and then maybe your output might be like whether they get diabetes or something, right? I don't know, I'm just coming up with something on this spot. So uh, basically, but this is the input. So we know exactly what we're putting in here. So now let's go through actually evaluating. So this is gonna have some type of value that we put in, right? Now here's the thing, ideally you wanna put your values for the inputs between zero and one, because as you'll see in a second, there's gonna be lots of calculations that are gonna be done. So you want these numbers to be kept very small, so that way it takes less computing power and it's more efficient, right? So you wanna always keep your inputs between zero and one. Uh, this is kind of the pre-processing part, right? So the neural network itself and everything, the architecture and everything, uh, yeah, that's important to figure that out, but ultimately it comes down to your data. Your data has to be, you have to have good data. If you don't have good data, your uh, network's gonna, not gonna work well, it's not gonna train, right? So you wanna make sure you have good data. So one thing that we wanna do is you wanna bring your values down to zero and one. And we're gonna, whenever we uh, go through the example, we're, we're, uh, I'll show you how we do this. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go to the next layer. So again, if you remember from the last slide, this is gonna have your input and it's gonna be multiplied by each of these weights, right? So each arrow is a weight, right? That's again, a trainable feature, right? So say for example, if I just take this neuron right here, right? This neuron is gonna take each of these guys' input, right, and multiply by the weights, right? So this guy, this guy's input multiplied by this weight, uh, so that goes into here, plus this guy's input times this weight right here, right? So if you know anything about matrices, you'll, this should seem kind of familiar, right? It's kind of like doing a matrix multiplication with the weights and the uh, inputs, right? So uh, GPUs are very good at. Um, oh, by the way, once you're when you're installing your packages, if you have a GPU, specifically an NVIDIA GPU, it won't work with the AMD CPU, GPU. Uh, then when you're installing, when I said pip install TensorFlow, uh, instead of TensorFlow, do TensorFlow dash GPU. Uh, that's just it's it's going to allow you to train your models faster. Uh, so like I was saying again, but uh, the GPUs are. Um, uh, and uh, specifically the NVIDIA GPUs, uh, because TensorFlow supports uh, uh, only has support for uh, NVIDIA GPUs. There's some software for AMD, but I, uh, I haven't really worked with that, and I don't really know how well it works. Uh, but for now, basically, if you want to do machine learning, you get a NVIDIA GPU. So NVIDIA GPUs have these things called tensor cores, and they allow the computer to do matrix multiplications really quickly. Uh, so again, evaluating a neural network, you're basically doing a bunch of matrix multiplications, right? So the weights of, or sorry, these guys' inputs, right, multiplied uh, by the uh, matrix for the weights, right? So that's gonna give you your input right here. Then you just add the bias, right? Uh, so you, you take that, uh, the product and you add the bias and then you put that through an activation function, right? So the, finally, the output of that, right, the out output of the activation function, that's gonna go to the next layer, right? So then again, it does the same exact thing. It's gonna uh, do the matrix multi multiplication with all of these guys' uh, inputs, meaning like what they're sending to the next layer, uh, out that what comes out of the activation function. So that goes on to the next layer, right? Each of these neurons get that, gets those values. Uh, so this forms the hidden layers, right? Now we're gonna go to the output layer. So uh, like I said, the example that I gave was diabetes, right? So uh, this output layer is gonna give us a likelihood of diabetes. So maybe zero would be that it has pretty much a zero chance of diabetes and one would be that it has a very high chance of diabetes, right? So uh, now here you'll notice that uh, it's between zero and one, right? So what you would use in this case is either, well, you'd probably use a sigmoid function, right? Because it's a binary type of thing. So a uh, sigmoid function, if you don't remember, it's kind of like uh, uh, like it goes, if I have a graph right here, like pretend like there's a graph and my mouse is the line, it goes kind of like this, right? Uh, kind of like a logistic function, if you uh, know. Uh, but basically, the values are going to be between 0 and 1. So based on the input, it'll go somewhere between 0 and 1. So sigmoid functions are good for binary outputs. Uh, and then we're, we're gonna use a different activation function for what we're gonna, for the output layer specifically. These ones are all gonna pretty much use ReLU, but uh, for the output layer, you might wanna modify it. So like, for example, another project, where I, what I had was, uh, I wanted the, I, I was uh, making a snake AI, 
and there I wanted to steer right, center, or left. Uh, so then I needed positive one, zero, and minus one, right? I need some input somewhere between there. Uh, so then I used another activation function called 10h, hyperbolic tangent. Uh, that one squeezes the values between minus one and one. So that, that was good for that application. So you, you have to design this based off of your application. Uh, the big thing is like, you know, what are your inputs? What are your outputs? Based off of that, you will determine these, uh, these things. Also, so these factors, uh, so right now, like the like activation functions, uh, and then later we'll learn about the, about uh, other, other parameters like um, loss, uh, learning rate, uh, and uh, optimizers, those things. So see, in regular pr programming, you'd probably call them parameters, but this is machine learning, right? So we, we call them hyperparameters. Um, so so the, yeah, if you see somebody talking about hyperparameters, that's what they're referring to. These basically these uh, parameters that we give in to uh, kind of determine the architecture of, of the neural network, right? Uh, okay, so now we evaluated, uh, kind of gone over evaluating the neural network, now loss, like I mentioned before, right? So loss is very important. Uh, we'll see why in a second. Uh, it's good for, optim uh, you, you want to know about your loss to optimize your, your uh, model. So uh, once you get your output, right, from your neural network, what you're going to do is you're going to compute the, um, the error, right? So the in this case, this is just simple, right? Um, but you want to do this for every single neuron. And this is part of the training process again. But uh, if you take the sum of the loss for all of the neurons, that's uh, going to give you the total loss, right? The error for all the neurons, that's going to give you the total loss, right? Uh, again, while we're training, we'll see how this works. But um, uh, so this is the kind of the, like, I guess, uh, for uh, the general formula, right? So we take the sum of all of the error, right? Output or um, mod output minus expected value that's that's the error for a single one right uh, i just showed i, I just showed uh, this one uh, the final output but uh, you uh, imagine this for all of the neurons right here so you take the sum of all of that and you get the total error right the total loss so okay we got the so that's the loss right uh, so let's show you how let, let me show you how that's important so uh, like this title says interpreting loss curves to optimize learning rate so learning rate is another uh, hyperparameter right so what learning rate allows you to do is or well no, it's what it does is so you have your optimizer right so uh, optimizer is uh, basically the kind of function that's going to use to train the algorithm and so the the uh, one of the parameters that you'll see for the optimizers is the learning rate, right? So the learning rate is how quickly it's willing to jump, right? So uh, if you imagine, like, uh, okay, so imagine like you're on a, you you have like a, a valley, right? You're trying to get to the bottom of the valley, right? So the bottom of the valley would be the minimum loss, right? Uh, ignore this loss curve for a second. Uh, I'm not talking about this, but uh, ideally you want to get to the bottom of the value, right? So imagine you could tweak all of your parameters and then you would get like a graph of like uh, peaks and valleys of the loss, right? Uh, so whenever you get your, uh, your your parameters almost perfect, right? I'm talking about the weights and the biases as a parameter in this case. So once your weights and biases are pretty much perfect, your, your loss should be almost down to zero, right? Uh, so you're looking to get to tweak your parameters to get to that point, right? That's called optimization uh, to find the minimum. Now, what your learning rate is is how like the strides that you're making, right? So like if you're trying to go downhill and you make like a bunch of steps very quickly, you might pass the lowest point without even knowing that you passed it, right? Uh, so uh, what the learning rate does is it kind of uh, determines how quickly your model is willing to change itself, to uh, optimize itself, right? So you don't want to have it be too slow, otherwise it's going to take forever to train your model. Uh, and you might not even be able to fully train it in the end, right? Uh, but you don't want it to be too high, otherwise it's going to make like jumps all over the place and you'll never uh, get to that, uh, at the bottom of that valley, right? For the loss, you'll never be able to uh, get to the smallest possible, the smallest possible loss. So. Uh, let's look at how we determine what the learning rate, uh, what, what, how we should optimize the learning rate. So uh, the loss curve, so what you'll see, so here, this is the ideal loss curve, right? So let me explain this to you. So 
this uh, y-axis over here, that's going to be our loss, right? So it should be something between like, well, it's going to be like some number, but uh, ideally you should kind of get it less than one. Uh, and obviously you want to get it as low as possible, but uh, it should be between zero and one. Uh, and then on the x-axis is the epochs. So epochs is, so you have your training data. So epochs is how many times your model is going to go through that training data, right? So uh, if you say five epochs, then it's going to go over the, the, um, the data five times. And at the end of each time, it's going to evaluate how well the uh, neural network did. So over time, you can see that the loss decreases kind of in like a exponential fashion. So this is ideal, right? So you want it to kind of drop off very quickly at the beginning and then it'll kind of taper off, right? And it'll kind of stabilize uh, at a pretty low number. So this is ideal. Next, this is what happens when your learning rate is too slow, right? It's too low. It's going down, but it's going down very slowly, right? Almost linearly. Uh, this is not good because it's going to take forever to bring it down and it might not even go all the way. It might c start coming back up. So th this is not ideal at all. Uh, this is too slow, right? So next, these are two examples of when it's too high, right? So when it starts like shooting up, right? Instead of going down, right? That, that means that your learning rate is too high because it's, it's going like all over the place trying to find the optimum values. But the problem is it's going too far, so it's actually uh, never able to get closer and closer to the bottom of that valley, right? Uh, and then this bottom example, what happens is like, okay, it went down quickly at the beginning, but then it kind of just like stays here, right? This is not a good number. This is like one or, this is like what, two point something, almost three uh, loss, right? So that's not good either. You wanna, like I said, you wanna bring it between zero and one, right? Um, and so th this is kind of stabilizing too high. And what might even happen is like it goes down here and then it starts like spiking and like going like almost like a random data, right? Uh, so that's not good either. Cause again, it's trying to get to that valley, but it's like, uh, like it, 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 it's overcorrecting kind of, right? So like it tries to get to the bottom of the valley and then it ends up running up the valley and then it does the same thing. And so it's never able to truly stabilize at the bottom. So then it'll, the 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 learning rate will kind of just fluctuate and it'll never sit 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 and stabilize. So uh, this is kind of so if you if you see this kind of loss curve, you probably want to decrease your learning rate. If you see this kind of loss curve, probably want to increase it. If you see this kind of loss curve, it, 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 you know you're you're in pretty good shape. So uh, yeah, that's that that's all. So now let's actually get into implementing it. So hopefully your uh, your uh, Hopefully your uh, environment is done being created and hopefully it's uh, installed in the packages. Uh, uh, can you tell me in the chat if, if you are ready? So just quickly, uh, let me activate that uh, environment. Okay, uh, and also let me get into. Okay, okay there we go. Uh, I don't know. Okay, hopefully you're ready. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get started on this. So, okay. Uh, first thing we're gonna have to do is we're gonna. So we're gonna. We're not gonna directly be using TensorFlow. We're gonna be using a kind of a sub-library of TensorFlow called Terrace, and it's much higher level, so it'll be easier for us to use and to uh, build models with. Uh, so let's actually import the model. So from tensorflow.terrace.models, uh, we're gonna import uh, the sequential model. So uh, this is the model that we're gonna be using. So, uh, okay, this is because it's, um, I have a graphics card, so it's gonna, be uh, opening up these kind of uh, binary files so that way it can, you know, make use of my graphics card. So, okay, so from tensorflow.keras.models uh, import sequential. So this is going to import the sequential model, which is a model that we're going to be using to build our neural network. Uh, it's kind of going to go, well, it's in the name, right, sequential. Uh, so 
it's gonna go in sequence, right, from the first layer, second layer, so on. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna import our dense layer, so tensorflow.keras.layers import dense. Okay, so this is the dense layer, it's gonna create densely connected neurons, right, so every neuron connects to every next neuron, and uh, so it's a dense layer. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna import our data set. Uh, so tensor tensorflow dot keras dot data sets dot mnist. Uh, we're gonna import it as mnist. Okay. So the mnist data set is. Uh, so this is usually what people uh, start off with, what, what they start learning with, uh, or you might want to maybe you can test out if your uh, environment is working with this data set. Um, so it has. So we're going to be using the regular MNIST data set, which just has a bunch of uh, handwritten digits. Uh, and we're going to look at the data set in a second. But uh, it has a bunch of digits. And there's also the fashion MNIST data set. That one has a bunch of uh, pictures of different uh, fashion or different clothing, right? Uh, so you, you'd want to classify that. So we're just going to stick with uh, classifying the numbers in a second uh, uh, right now. So let, let's go ahead and load this data. So uh, the way that, so the way to load the data is mnist.load data, but uh, this is just going to be like a bunch of, it's basically going to be like a bunch of arrays inside of arrays inside of arrays, uh, because uh, actually it's going to be tuples inside of tuples and then arrays inside of arrays. Uh, but uh, that's because this is, um, uh, it's, it's a bunch of different images all represented in arrays. So we're going to have to divide this data up uh, so the way we're going to do that is using tuples like this. So uh, we're going to split it up into training and testing batches. So uh, uh, train, uh, okay, and then x test and y test. Okay, so let me explain to you what this is. So we're getting the data, right? So the way that they divided this up is the first, so it's going to be a tuple, right? If, you, if I printed this data out right now, it would be a tuple. So the so it would be a tuple with two values, and each of those have a tuple inside of it. So the first tuple contains a training data set, and the second tuple contains the testing data set. And then within those tuples, there are two NumPy arrays. The first one contains all of our images, and the second one contains all of our uh, answers. So right. So the if we we're going to see in a second the first image right here is going to have a handwritten image of a 5 and then this one will have the actual integer value of 5. Same thing over here but just it'll be a smaller data set. So this I think has like 6,000 this one has 1,000. Uh, so uh, another thing that we want to uh, you want to do when you're uh, when you have your data set is you want to divide it up into a training and testing split. Uh, so training data is basically what it's training off of right and testing data is what you're going to test at the end. The reason why you test it, though, is because you don't want to. You want to make sure that outside of your testing stuff, does your neural network work on outside data that's never seen before? Because if it doesn't, what that means is that what it means is that you have um, you have overfitting, or you could have underfitting, right? So basically, if you if if, if it has a high accuracy on the test training data set, but a low accuracy in the testing data set, that means it's basically memorize the training data set. So whenever you give it something else, it's, it's not, not going to work, right? Like imagine if there was somebody trying to cheat on a test, and so they just memorize all the answers. But then as soon as you give them a new batch of questions, they, they, they have no idea what they're doing, right? Uh, so this is basically the same thing. We're just trying to make sure that uh, we can get the, um, we can get the neural network to actually kind of, not not exactly understand the data, but basically, uh, I don't know how to put it into words, but um, we want to have it be able to train on the data without memorizing it. Uh, I, I don't know how else to put it, but uh, yeah, so we, we don't want it to memorize the thing, so we're going to test it. So anyway, so we got our data now. So let's look at the, uh, we're going to look at this data. So why train, right? So uh, this is going to have all of our answers, right? So if we look at zero, just to see what the answer is for the first one, we'll see that it's five, right? So 
The answer to the first one should be five. So let's go ahead and we're gonna need to import uh, matplotlib right now. Uh, uh, let's also go ahead and import numpy because uh, we're gonna need it later. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna just make some order. Um, Okay, so let's take a look at that um, first image. So we're gonna use this function called imshow. Uh, on we're gonna use it. On, actually, first let me just show you uh, what that looks like. So uh, let's print x train of zero. Okay, so uh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So if you count this out, it'll be a twenty-eight by twenty-eight image. Uh, let me show you the, okay, there you go, you can see, or if I print out zero, okay, there we go, you can see it's a 28 by 28 image. So now let's actually, okay, I'm gonna show the image, so plt.imshow, uh, and we're gonna use the first image, so again, the, the Y train data said it was five, uh, let's check that, right, so I'm gonna put this inside of this function called imshow, which allows us to it shows the image. Uh, so, okay, and we're gonna say the color map is gonna be gray. Uh, so this is just gonna make it grayscale because if, if you look right here, there's no RGB values. It's a uh, grayscale image. So, uh, okay, and so now we can just show this. And there we go. So you can see that this is in fact a five. Uh, and you, you can do this with the, you can go ahead and try this with the other, um, other images as well. Uh, it should all be correct. Uh, and there's so there's six you saw right here there's six thousand sixty thousand sorry actually sixty thousand uh, images inside of this X train data set uh, and I think there's ten thousand then not one thousand but ten thousand in the X test data set so yeah, that's a lot um, okay so now that we kind of got an idea of how the images are right so it's a six if you have sixty thousand twenty eight by twenty eight images inside of the X train right. So first off, what we need to do is, this is a two-dimensional array, right? Each image is a 28 by 28 two-dimensional array. Well, our neural network, we need to have, for our neural network, we need to have it be one-dimensional, right? Because the, the input layer, if you remember, it, it's just a single line of neurons, right? So uh, let, let's go ahead and flatten our data, right? So I'll say x train equals x train dot reshape. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna reshape it to be, so uh, we need to be we need it to be flat, right? So uh, when it's flat, that means it's gonna be 28 times 28, right? So uh, it's gonna be instead of 28 by 28, it's gonna be one by 28 squared. Now 28 squared is 784, so that means it's gonna be uh, something, right? By 784. Well, that something is the number of images that we have, right? So in this case, it was 60,000. But I'm just going to put a minus one. So there we go. Now that should work, right? So if I print out x train dot, sh yeah, x train dot shape, you can see it's sixty thousand by seven hundred and eighty-four. Uh, so th this is um, instead of sixty thousand by twenty-eight by twenty-eight as it was before, if you remember, it's going to be sixty thousand by seven hundred eighty-four. What this means is that all the images that we had before, where there was like it was kind of like a square. Now they're just a flat line, right? So we turned it into a line, and that's going to be easier for a neural network. Let's go ahead and do the same thing, but for the test. So test, and I'll go over here and put test. Okay. So now we got both of these data sets to be flat, right? So instead of being a two-dimensional image, it's now just a flat line of numbers. Okay. So now um, that we got it to be flat, if you remember the values okay let me just show you uh, x uh, x test of zero and I'll just show the first five values okay so you see okay that's not it okay so let me just show the whole thing okay you'll see that these values are actually the RGB values well not RGB values but they're basically hexadecimal values turned into decimal values so it's gonna go from 0 to 255 right uh, so going to 255, that's not very good for our neural networks. If you remember, I told you, we wanna bring that down to be somewhere between zero and one. So 
what we're going to do is it's, it's very simple. We can just divide the data sets by 255. So that way, if it's 255, we'll get 1. If it's 0, we'll get you know 0 divided by 255 is 0. So everything is going to be squeezed somewhere between 0 and 1. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, x train equals x train divided by 255. Uh, by the way, here, uh, uh, x train divide, like if you did like uh, this kind of thing, that does not work here for some reason. Uh, so yeah, uh, don't, don't do that. Uh, but OK, so there we go. So we got uh, the data sets divided by 255. So everything should be between 0 and 1. You can see right here, right? So everything's between 0 and 1. OK, so now that that's. So that now that all of that is good, uh, so we've pre-processed our training, like the X data, right? Now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and turn these into something called uh, one-hot encodings, right? So one-hot encodings, what that basically does is, so if you remember the Y train of zero, this is just a five, right? Now here's the thing, remember I told you that the neural network is going to spit out some numbers between 0 and 1, right? So the problem with that is, is that this is, this is 5, right? So it's going to go somewhere between 0 and 9. That, that's, not, that's not good, right? It's not uh, useful to us because uh, it's going to have to calculate values going higher than 1. So instead what we're going to do is if we have a 5, Instead of that, here, let me write this in the comment. So instead of 5, we write, so we do a one hot encoding, and that gives us, so 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, I think one more 0, 1, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, sorry, actually, 1, okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so it's basically going to turn the 5 into this this array right here, right? So the reason why we'd want this is because now you can imagine that each of these is the output of a single neuron, right? So uh, the, the, so the digits are going to be between 0 and 9, right? That means we have 10 classes, right? So the classes are you want to, the number of classes that you have is the number of output neurons you want to have. So in this case, when we build our neural network, we're going to want to have 10 output neurons, and we're going to want to have 784 input neurons, right? Because our image is a flat 784 uh, pixel array, and this uh, output is going to be uh, between 10 classes, right? 0 through 9, uh, those are our classes, right? So in this case, what would happen is that uh, so it, it would give us kind of like percentages, right? So it looks like, uh, I don't know, this many, this much percent like a five, or this, this percent like a zero, this percent like a one, this percent like a two, uh, and so on. And then this percent like a five, right? So this is 100% like a five. It looks like 100% like a five, right? So actually, that's wrong. Uh, I was correct before. Uh, so this should be the one, and this should be the zero. OK. <laughs> OK, so this is because 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, right? So uh, this is what it would actually look like, not ignore this thing. OK, so it's going to create uh, this kind of one hot encoding. So that way, this is going to light up. It's, this neuron is going to be like, OK, this is, looks like 100% like a 5. So then whatever value you get highest out of this, that index, well, that index plus 1 is going to be the um, no, sorry, no, just that index is going to be our uh, predicted value, right? So in this case, if you got this output, like uh, we could say, like, okay, the fifth index has the highest value, right? Uh, so then we would say, okay, the prediction is five. Okay. Anyways, so now that we got that, let's go ahead and actually apply this to the, uh, let's go ahead and apply this to our, let's do this pre processing for the, Labels. So, so for label in y train, so this what this is going to do is it's going to take every single number, it's going to iterate through them, and it's going to put them in label. So temp, that's just a, a regular array, or a list, I guess. Uh, append, oh, actually, I forgot to import something. Uh, OK, let's go ahead and import 
the uh, so from pair er, tensorflow dot keras dot utils dot uh, import uh, to categorical. Okay, so this is the function that will basically allow us to create that one-hot encoding. This function is going to take us from that five to the zero 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 blah 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 one, right? Uh, and then zero zero zero. So uh, this is the function that's going to take us to that. So now we can go ahead and create this thing. So uh, temporary. So this is going to be our temp, and then for label in y train, and I'll explain how, how this works in a second. So temp dot append. Okay, so we're going to put our function to categorical, uh, and then we're going to put a label in there, uh, and we're going to do this parameter num classes equals ten. Okay. So, and then let me just add one more line. Okay. Let's add one more line. Okay. So, uh, last line is ten equals uh, np dot array. Okay. So what we're doing here is we're going to, uh, sorry, not temp, uh, but actually, uh, OK. So what we're doing here is we're going to iterate through every value in y train, right? We're going to store it in label. Then at the end of the temp uh, temp list, we're going to apply, we're going to add this thing, right? Uh, so we're going to put the label through the two categorical function. And the num classes is 10, because again, we have 10 digits from 0 to 9. OK. So once you get that uh, appended to the temp, we'll, once we go through all of the Y train, we're going to convert the temp into a NumPy array, and then we're going to store it inside Y train. OK, there we go. That's done. So now let's do the same thing, except replace Y train with Y test. OK. OK, there we go. Done. So now, the, now if you look at uh, y train of zero, you'll see it turns that this is what it's supposed to be, right? So the fifth, fifth uh, neuron has lit up. Okay. So now we're done pre-processing the data. Let's actually get into building our neural network. Okay. So let me clear the screen, and so we're gonna create the sequential model, right? So sequential. Okay. OK, there we go. So this basically just uh, initialized my GPU. Um, OK, so let's clear that stuff up. So we have our model right here, right? Um, so now we're going to go ahead and start adding layers to this model. So we're going to create, the first one is going to be a dense layer. Uh, it's going to be, well, all of them are going to be dense layers. But So we're going to add 512 neurons. The input shape is going to be 784, right? Um, OK. So, and then the activation function is going to be ReLU. Okay. So, what this does is going to add 512 neurons inside of this first layer. So, this input shape, this is just going to be on the first layer, right? Because it's going to take in 784 pixels. And so then it's going to put that into this 512. That's the inputs, right? And then it's going to be weights in between. And then the activation function is going to be ReLU. Okay. So now model, we're going to add one more, another layer. So dense, uh, let's make that 128. Uh, then activation equals ReLU. OK, now model.add dense, dense. Uh, OK, 10 neurons for this. So this is the last class, right? Because now we're going to have our 10 output neurons. So now the activation is not going to actually, it's not going to be ReLU. It's going to be uh, softmax, OK? Uh, so this is usually when you're doing categorical stuff, like what we're doing right now, you want to use a softmax function. Uh, so that activation function is going to make it so that way all of our categories are from 0 to 1. And yeah, you'll see in a second. So, okay, now what we can do is we can say model.summary. So it'll print out a summary of our neural network. So this is pretty cool if it prints out an ASCII table. So you can see the first one is going to uh, give out 512 neurons. Uh, the reason why it's double is because... Uh, you know, if you were doing like a convolutional neural network or something, uh, but we'll cover that um, in either the next class or the class after that. Uh, then 128 neurons and then 10. Mm -hmm. Now you'll see this is a pretty interesting number of parameters. This is our weights and biases. This is the number of weights and biases. So you'll see that there's total parameters, trainable parameters, and non-trainable parameters. 
right now these are the same because so if you were doing something like transfer learning then you might want to uh, have different values for this but um, for now we're just gonna have everything be tradable right so again this is how many weights and biases you can see so it, this is pretty crazy right we have 468,874 different trainable parameters it's gonna have to tweak all of these different parameters to make the neural network uh, mo most accurate, right? Uh, so this is pretty crazy. Like uh, you can imagine in just like your normal things, like it, it, in something where you might have to tweak some parameters to try and make something work. Uh, but normally in your normal life, you have like a few parameters, right? Like um, maybe two or three different things that you can change and you try and optimize it to try and make something the best. I don't know exactly <laughs> what situation I'm thinking of, but uh, I'm sure you can imagine something like that, uh, right, uh, in your day-to-day -day life. But this is 468,000 parameters, so that, that's pretty uh, crazy. Anyway, so once we, so that's that's what our um, model looks like. Uh, let's so now let's actually compile our model. So model .compile. Okay, so this is where we add some of our hyperparameters. So uh, our loss. Right, so we want to add our loss function in here. So the loss function that we're going to use is called categorical uh, cross entropy. Okay, so this is usually whenever you have categorical data, like we have right now, you want to use this this loss function. So this will uh, give you the loss that's more uh, uh, gives you more useful data for optimizing. So now. Uh, optimizer, this is our optimizer function. Uh, so you're, we're just going to use Atom. This is usually the choice you're going to use. Um, most people just use Atom. Uh, you might have to use a different one later on, but for now, we'll just use Atom. Uh, and then metrics uh, equals accuracy. Okay. So this is what it's going to optimize. So it's going to try to optimize the accuracy of the model. Okay. So there we go. Now we've co compiled our model. Okay, so now we're gonna actually, now let's actually train our model, right? So this is the exciting part, right? Uh, we're gonna actually train it. Um, but remember, like I said, we need to look at the loss curves, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna store, uh, so as it, com as it trains, it's gonna give us the data. Uh, it's gonna return the data. So uh, it's gonna be in a history object. So we're just gonna store it in a variable called history. Uh, and so then uh, we'll actually train the model. So the, func uh, the function for that is called model.fit. Uh, so we're giving it our uh, x data, our y data. And then uh, we specify, remember, I said epochs. So we're going to just do five epochs. Uh, so that means it's going to go over the training data five times, right? OK, so now let's look at the validation data. So uh, validation data, we're going to give it uh, x test and y test. Okay, so validation data basically is just, um, well, it's kind of in the name, right? It validates the model. So at the end of every epoch, it'll try and evaluate on the, uh, eval uh, on the validation data. Uh, so we can see, right, so we'll see the, the training accuracy, and then we'll see the validation accuracy. So that'll, that difference will kind of tell us uh, if it's overfitting or anything like that. So. Uh, once I hit enter, we'll trade it. So three, two, one, done. Okay. So there we go. It's training now. Uh, this is the progress. Uh, for some reason, it's not able to open the uh, the uh, what's it called curses to try and make this loading bar uh, work like how it's supposed to. But anyways, okay. So ideally, you you would just see like five bars right here because we have five epochs. Uh, but for some reason here, I think it's because it's in the IPython shell. Uh, it's not displaying it properly. Um, so anyway, so yeah, we see the at the end. So this is our loss. Remember I was telling you to tell us our loss. So you can see this is really good, right? 0 0.03. Of course, in validation, it's, it's a little higher, right? But still not too bad. Now let's look at the accuracy. So the accuracy during the training was 98.97% accurate. That's pretty amazing. Uh, but the validation accuracy, this is like, uh, this is will tell us kind of what it's actually at. So that's going to be 97.4%, still pretty good, right? Um, okay. So now, like I said, uh, right, uh, we have the history. Now, uh, you could look back on this and see how the loss changed and everything like that. But uh, you can see actually at the end here, it kind of increased. 
So you, do, you don't want to have too many epochs. Uh, you don't want to train it for too long, otherwise it might even, uh, the loss might even go up and accuracy might even go down a little bit. But uh, this is still pretty good. Uh, but let's look at our uh, history to try and look at the loss curve, right? So uh, history dot history. So this will give us a dictionary uh, with all of the data. So we're going to look specifically at the loss. OK. Uh, and then let's just add some things to make it look nicer. So we'll call it loss. And I'll actually label it. So plt dot x label. Uh, we'll call it epoch. And the uh, y label is going to be the loss, right? Uh, okay, so now let's actually show the graph, and there we go. So you can see this is pretty similar. Of course, right here we only have five data points, so it's going to be a pretty rough graph. But uh, you can see that it kind of follows the ideal loss curve, right? So starts off very quickly, right? So it dropped uh, from like about ni uh, 0.19 to 0 0.08 very quickly uh, in the first epoch. Then second epoch, it kind of goes a little bit less, and then a little bit less, and a little bit less, right? So you can see that this is a good loss curve. OK. So now that we know, so now we have our model, right? So our model can uh, predict on things. So let's actually uh, do a prediction. So model.predict uh, x test. So remember, uh, well, this, we already validated this data, but this is basically, if you didn't do the validation, this is how you would compare. So this is, so let's predict it. So now we have our predictions, right? You can see that was a lot faster because before we were training, but actually evaluating. So remember, this is going over 10,000. This is running our neural network on 10,000 different images. And that's very quick, right? Because evaluating the neural network itself is not, it, it's not, it doesn't take as much computing power as it does to do uh, the training. Of course, it still you know takes computing power, and I have a GPU, so it's faster. But um, it's it's not as bad as training, obviously, because in training you have to optimize all those features and zoom a lot more stuff. Okay, and also it's going over much more data. Okay, so anyways, we have our predictions here, right? So uh, if I just look at prediction zero, you'll see that it's still in the one hot encoded format. Um, so we want to make this human readable. OK. So what we'll do is we'll use this function. So OK. Uh, we'll use this function called, actually, yeah, OK. So we'll use this function called argmax, so np.argmax. Uh, uh, and we'll do predictions and set the access to 1. OK. So what this will do is it's going to basically reverse the effects of that two categorical function. Um, so now if we look at predictions of zero, you'll see that it says seven, right? Okay, so now this is, we can actually read this, right? So uh, the way that this works is it's gonna look at the value that's the max, right? The max argument uh, inside of here and we specified axis equals one. That means it'll look at each of the rows, right? Uh, not the columns. So it'll look at the rows, figure out what's the biggest value, and it'll that that the index will be um, given out as the as the answer. So in this case, it's seven. So the it predicts that the first image portrays a, uh, displays a seven. So let's let's check if that's true. So uh, plt dot m show uh, x test. Uh, Zero. Now, if you remember, we changed this to be a flat image. So let's go ahead and reshape this to be 28 by 28. Uh, again, color map is going to be gray. And let's show that graph. As you can see, it is a 7, right? OK, so there we go. We got, we predicted a 7, and it is a 7, right? So this is coming out of your neural network. So that's, that's pretty cool. OK, so yeah, that, that's all for um, today. It, it uh, went a little bit longer, um, but yeah, we, uh, I think that that was a pretty good lesson. Uh, uh, thanks for joining. And next time, I think we're going to do, we'll either do uh, convolutional neural networks or recurrent neural networks. Uh, and then I'll uh, teach you probably transfer learning. Uh, and then yeah, that, that'll probably be it for the rest of the year. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining, and uh, bye.